Um, thank you for joining us today. Today's topic is, is value investing dead. Uh, very controversial, but often talked about uh, conversation. Um, Factor-based investing with Dr. Wealth. Uh, my name is Sam Ree. I'm the Chief Investment Officer and Chairman at Indawas. And uh, it's really my pleasure to have with us today Alvin Chow, the CEO of Dr. Wealth. Alvin, say hi to everybody. Hi, everyone. Hi, Sam. Thanks for having me. Uh, looking forward to this show. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us. Real pleasure. Really excited about today because there's a lot to talk about, a lot of fun stuff. Um, and so we will um, get kicking. So first of all, um, we're going to do a quick disclaimer and also a quick plug for the Indawas YouTube live channel. Uh, please join us. We have wonderful topics that we've talked about in the past um, about markets or personal finance or, you know, investing, you know, for your family, uh, also CPF and SRS and how to manage cash. Um, in Dallas is a platform that manages all of your sources of funds. Um, so really excited to have uh, everybody join us. And Dr. Wealth fans, and there's so many people out there, big fans and followers of Dr. Wealth. So welcome. Um, we're co-hosting tonight. So although I'm moderating and I'm hoping Alvin talks more than I do, um, it's a joint uh, co-hosted event. So really happy to have a broad audience join us today to uh, talk about this wonderful topic. Also, a quick plug for Indawas Live next week. Uh, Greg Van, uh, the CEO of Indawas, and I will be hosting a session about managing your cash. You know, with rapidly falling interest rates, you know, where can we find yield? It's so tough out there. Bank accounts are slashing their deposit rates. Fixed deposit rates are falling. Sing, you know, SSB rates have fallen so dramatically. So it's really important. And there's some important announcement from Indawas that we want to share with you. So. <clears throat> Everybody who can join, please join us uh, to discuss cash and investing uh, next week as well. So a quick plug on uh, Indawas or introduction more like. Uh, so Indawas is really about helping people invest better so they can live easier today and live better tomorrow. And really, we are focused on retirement solutions, uh, helping people meet their retirement adequacy uh, by you know investing long term and holistically in a personalized manner, most suitable for your personal circumstances. And we really set up the company because we felt that, you know, it was difficult uh, as investors, individual investors to invest in Singapore. Um, so we care about a few things and focus on doing them well and doing it right. So it's really about access, advice and cost and we give access to institutional share class or exclusive access to funds. Dimensional is uh, not exclusive, but um, one of the few in independent financial advisors in Singapore that we distribute through, but also we give access to institutional share class like PINCO funds um, and exclusive access to passive investing on CPF because we brought in Vanguard managed passive funds into CPF uh, for the first time. And because we provide 100% rebate of trailer fees, which is the cost portion, um, you can only buy it through in Dawas, which is um, interesting. Uh, but we stand on the shoulder of giants um, because we focus on um, working with fund managers. Uh, we're also the safest pair of hands. We've introduced the double ledger system. So unlike some of the other robos, uh, we work with the OBK Hen, <clears throat> the largest domestic broker, and all the accounts are created in your own name. So funds are transferred from the bank account in your own name to the OBK Hen account in your own name. So Indawas never touches the money and it is the safest way to manage wealth in Singapore. And just understanding on the shoulders of Giants part, we, we are agnostic to product. We're an open platform. Whatever is the best in class, most suitable for you. And what is the easiest, the cheapest and the best uh, we bring into Singapore or we localize it in Sing dollars, make it tax efficient. Um, so we partner with the largest global and local fund managers like Dimensional um, and many of these other guys who manage you know, trillions of money. So these are the best products and giving access to them. It's almost like group buying. Uh, so we become the institution and allow you access to institutional share classes and products that were previously not available in Singapore. So with that, I wanted to hand over to Alvin to give some introduction to Dr. Wealth and uh, himself. Alvin, over to you. Thank you, Sam. I'm Alvin. I'm the CEO of Dr. Wealth. So Dr. Wealth is a company that focuses a lot on education, uh, financial education to be exact, uh, because we all know that uh, given 
uh, financial products, their complexity, and uh, it's not easy for the layman, especially someone without a finance background to really understand. And also, um, when it comes to money and wealth, uh, it's a very important topic in uh, our modern society. So um, I strongly believe in uh, educating the consumers so that they can make a, a more sound financial decision that can impact their lives a lot more. So uh, pretty much aligned with and down us uh, is really for the men on the street. And uh, how we do that is uh, we do a lot of uh, online content. We do a lot of videos, uh, written articles to really explain um, more related to the stock market, okay? And uh, specific stocks at times, like for example, recently there was a SIA rights issue. And uh, the, the problem is that most people don't even understand what it is. And we try to break down uh, it to layman terms and so that the shareholders will be able to understand what uh, they need to decide on. And we also do a lot of uh, causes um, with uh, different trainers and uh, they all bring in different kind of uh, experience and expertise uh, because no one knows everything in the market and uh, a lot of people use different methods and they have different objectives as well. So that's why uh, we believe in uh, getting the uh, um, all those uh, top investors uh, who invest uh, based on their own uh, based on their money right to come and share their knowledge and experience. And uh, we also create, uh, uh, lately we created an app to also provide information uh, more about all this uh, uh, stock data, etc. For the, for the individual investors to uh, assess them easily uh, and it's free of charge. So if you are interested, you can just go and uh, play around with it. Um, uh, you can just go to drwealth.com and uh, you should be able to find the link to the app. So, yep, that's all when about you, when the app, Alvin. Uh, just last month, actually. Just oh, really? Month. I didn't know. Okay, I should check uh, it out too. Yeah. We're developing an app and it will be out uh, soon as well, hopefully, next That's month. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that. And uh, just moving on to the next slide, maybe you can kick off the session uh, with our uh, Benjamin Graham slide. Okay, so the topic for today is about value investing, is that? Okay, and... Um, Let's talk a little bit about how value investing came about, the history of it. Um, I, would, I would mark the year at 1934 where the security analysis textbook was being uh, published and it was written by uh, Benjamin Graham and uh, David Dodd. All right, the two of them have written this book together. And um, why is it important is because um, uh, this is like the Bible of value investing. And uh, the funny thing is that Benjamin Graham has never used this term value investing, never in his literature. And it was um, uh, thereafter, you know, when more, uh, more people start to really follow this way of investing and it became uh, in vogue that people started to coin a name for it and they just call it value investing. And of course, because he was the guy who came out with it and he now holds the name father of value investing. So that is, uh, but unfortunately he's not around anymore. And, uh, but his literature survived uh, his times. And uh, even today, um, there are still a lot of people practicing this value investing. Right. Next slide, please. And um, fast forward to 1992, okay? And that's where the academics were um, trying to um, do some research on the stock market uh, regarding uh, what kind of uh, factors uh, would deliver higher returns. And uh, of course, value being one of the uh, most popular strategies that has been used by a lot of investors, the researchers were interested to really find out, right? Uh, do they really um, give the uh, outperformance that uh, all these investors are talking about? So what they did, um, this, these two uh, professors, uh, Eugene Pharma and Kenneth French, and uh, they written this paper called the cross section of expected stock returns. Um, you can take a look. Uh, I think the paper is free um, because it has been uh, decades ago, published decades ago. So you can take a look if you are interested, uh, especially if you have uh, suffering from insomnia, right? Research paper are always a very good cure for that. Uh, <laughs> so uh, basically what they were saying was that um, they, they discovered that, yes, indeed it was true that uh, if you buy value stocks, um, you should be able to get outperformance, right? That means higher returns than the uh, index itself. And as well as they also discovered a uh, next factor, which was size, 
It, that means that the smaller companies you buy, the higher returns you get. Okay. And then uh, we move on to the next slide. Uh, that's where uh, another factor, profitability factor was discovered by another professor, Robert Novi Marx in 21.3. And um, his, his argument was that uh, there are another group of stocks that doesn't look like value at all, right? They are, in fact, value investors may not even like them because they, they tend to be more overvalued. And uh, he proved that uh, even this group of stocks are able to achieve higher than, higher than market returns. And uh, despite looking uh, very different from what the value stocks were. So then he gave it a name called the profitability factor. So um, these are the core factors that uh, personally I used. Okay. And um, so far they have served me well. And that's why I talk about them today. Okay. Next slide, please. Well, that's great. And just wanted to introduce uh, Dimensional, who is our fund manager partner and the two professors who originally came up with the factors uh, of uh, value and small, um, Eugene Farmer and Kenneth French. And Eugene Farmer um, won, uh, as most people know, a Nobel Prize uh, for his seminal work in portfolio theory. And Kenneth French, uh, who we've met before as well, are all serving as dimensional uh, directors. And Dimensional really began in the 70s based on these uh, rigorous academic research about the proven factors of returns um, and other Nobel laureates. There's four of them here alone, <laughs> Bob Merton, Miller, Merton, Miller, Myron Scholes, uh, but Robert Novi Marx that, um, you know, Alvin just mentioned also is a consultant to Dimensional from 2014. And so uh, these proven factors of return, Dimensional really pioneered in, you know, systematically implementing in the funds. Uh, since then, many others have also done that, and factor-based uh, based investing is a bit of a, you know, um, fad or really, you know, a common place. Uh, but I think that, you know, there's different nuances, and I think Alvin and I will touch on some of those important ones. And just wanted to show us the Endowers team with the Dimensional founder, David Booth, um, you know, when he visited us in Singapore. Uh, but the factors of uh, the systematic factors, I think there has to be a certain criteria that we should really think about. Um, these factors, we can't just because there's so many factors now. Um, there's momentum factors, but, you know, volatility factors and, you know, index factors that are coming up every other month, it seems like. Uh, but these factors need to be, you know, have certain characteristics. So on the right, you can see that they have to be sensible. It has to be um, persistent. Um, big over time has to be pervasive that is across all markets that it's not just in the Angolan market or you know the Sri Lanka market uh, pervasive uh, has to be robust has to be tested and proven uh, but also the final thing that I think most people don't realize is that there is a cost to trading and investing always whichever way you do it is it possible to harvest these proven factors cost effectively so I think that's the other thing that, um, you know, a large fund manager like Dimensional can do um, across the various size, price and profitability factors. And it's also important to understand that factors behave differently through cycles. Um, so size and value tend to do well when markets fall and recover. And then in an expansion market like we are in right now or have been, uh, momentum does quite well. But, you know, through cycles, quality and volatility factors sometimes work as well. So it's important to know that uh, over cycles and over long periods of time, factors don't always do well every single year. That's you know something that you cannot expect because that wouldn't be a factor that would be alpha, right? So, um, so I think it's important to understand that every year it doesn't always work. Sometimes it doesn't work for long periods, uh, but these are proven factors over long periods of time that have been uh, researched and uh, categorized. So the three major factors that people use and Alvin introduced to us is the size and relative uh, price and profitability. And these are pervasive across different markets that uh, we've shown here. Um, so across US stocks and developed markets and emerging markets over long periods of time. And obviously the US has the longest period from you know, the depression era of 1928, uh, but uh, you know, developed markets, emerging market 70s and 80s, so shorter. But, uh, across all these periods, we see that these factors have actually shown uh, to um, give us, um, you know, outsized returns or premiums, as they're so sometimes called. 
Um, and just going to the next page, um, if you look at the annualized return, and this is the US because it has the longest history, the first one is markets. So basically the, the market premium of stocks, uh, which has higher risk, which is higher risk premium. And you can harvest that over time, over bonds uh, or fixed income. And then the second one is a size, small value, and then high. And you can see, as I mentioned that, you know, every year, sometimes these fluctuate. So it's not consistent, but over time, these premiums can be harvested. And these are the 10 year rolling premiums. And the one that really stands out is value. And we'll go into more detail with Alvin about value because that's the major topic today. And it's the most hottest topic. Um, why value is underperforming, underperforming for so long. And so we'll go into more detail about that. Alvin, do you want to talk to a couple of these slides? Sure. So this was pulled out uh, or from the original paper by Pharma and French in 1992. So basically it's just a, a visual explanation of it. Um, that uh, how they do the research was um, they will just break up all the stocks in the uh, universe and then they will, uh, oh, is the slides are gone. Okay. Okay, it's back. All right, so um, I'll just carry on from here. Uh, so they break down the um, stocks into 10, equal groups, right? So each group has the same number of stocks and um, they rank it from the uh, most expensive stocks to the cheaper stocks based on the definition of value, right? Which is uh, mainly using the uh, book value of the company to compare to the, the price of the securities. So essentially what they found was that um, if you buy the cheapest group, which is group 10 okay, in this uh, chart, the, the monthly return was 1.63% per month. If you bought the most expensive group, you will get 0.64% per month over the same period, of course. And that is almost uh, three times difference in terms of their performance. And um, with this, then they concluded that the value factor existed. And it's not just in the US markets, but uh, all around the world. And uh, like what uh, Sam has said, it, it must be pervasive. Otherwise, uh, it cannot be counted as a factor. And uh, they also tested for small caps as well, uh, just that the difference in the performance between the largest cap and the smallest cap group, um, the, the difference is uh, slightly less than half, right? Slightly less than half uh, or slightly uh, uh, double, right? The uh, large cap stocks, okay? So essentially what it's trying to say is uh, if you buy the smallest group of stocks, uh, you, you tend to do well than buying the big caps that are well known. Right. And uh, that is also shown over a long periods of time. And, and it's important to note as well that uh, you cannot assume that this is this whole true every year. Right. There will be some years that uh, small cap don't do well. There'll be some year value will do well. Right. And um, yeah, so I just want to really uh, conclude a little bit about uh, factors because we've been using the word uh, quite often since we started this session. And um, if uh, I can explain it as simple as possible using one liner would be uh, factors are used to determine, okay, basically is to determine what drives higher stock returns, okay. And um, because we all know that nowadays we can invest in index funds, right. Uh, and we know that it's very, very hard to uh, beat the market. Okay, to do better than indices because uh, uh, data have shown that most investors, including funds, active funds, are, are not able to uh, beat the index so easily, especially after cost. So um, factors are being used um, to uh, give that uh, probability, right, that edge, the edge to really um, get higher returns than the stock market because they have been tested and uh, proven over the years in different kind of market conditions as well. So uh, if you buy, uh, if you build a portfolio based on these factors, you should do better than the index funds over the long run. So there is some economic value to it and uh, why uh, we pay so much attention to all these factors. And uh, there are, I would say that there are two general ways to, to do this uh, factor investing. So one way is to systematically build a well-diversified portfolio. That means using um, uh, funds from like dimensional uh, advisors. So uh, that's one way because um, what they do is that uh, they will apply what their research has said and uh, to the real world to form all this portfolio. And uh, you don't need to do 
the dirty work. Okay, so they will do it on behalf of you, and you just need to uh buy the entire fund, right? And and I think they have like probably thousands and thousands of securities, so it's definitely very well diversified, and uh globally as well. So um that makes it uh easier, uh more fast free, right? Um the more troublesome way is the the way that I use it, uh which uh, I do use factors as a starting point. Okay, that's where I screen out the stocks uh, before I look at them in more details because there are so many securities out there and I definitely do not have the time to look through every one of them. And Factors does give me that edge um, to look at a bunch of stocks that have a higher chance of beating the market. Right? So I, I start with an advantage rather than I start with um, uh, from ground zero. Right? So that's how I use Factors. And thereafter, I will uh, look into the stock in more details so uh, I will tend to uh, build a more concentrated portfolio, not as diversified. And when I do that, that would mean that the qualitative analysis would be important, right? On top of the quantitative analysis that I do. Um, and the problem with this is that um, the variance of the results will be very large. Okay, So if you want to do this, the variance of the results will be very large because uh, either you outperform very well or you underperform very badly so uh, that is that risk uh, that we are talking about and in fact it will take up a lot of effort uh, and and time as well so if you have no interest in reading annual report and financial statements then i would say systematically build a well diversified portfolio through uh, some of these funds would be the better approach right just go pure quantitative and the uh, diversification will take care of itself yeah, so yeah. that is essentially yeah. what Factors is about. Yeah, so just to summarize, Factors are really the things, the characteristics that drive higher stock returns, as you mentioned here. And, you know, somebody was asking what is value and value is one factor. So it's among many different factors that we mentioned, like, you know, small caps or momentum or quality. Uh, value is one factor, but it's so uh, important because as we showed in the earlier slides, especially for those who are joining us late, um, it's something that is the most dominant form of investing. Um, it's also been around the longest and for a lo the longest time value had done so well. Um, so everybody was a proponent or, you know, everybody was a value investor, right? And so uh, that's why it's such a critical topic. And unlike in the past, uh, recently, value has underperformed quite a lot. And so that's why every year, if you search, is value investing dead? That's like one of the most popular, you know, Google searches uh, on value. So with that, I think, you know, Alvin, maybe you can touch on the value aspect, you know, that specific factor. And we'll go into more details about is value investing truly dead or not? Um, what are the factors behind the factor? Yeah. Uh, you're on mute, Alvin. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, probably I'll just add on to the definition of value. Uh, basically, it's as simple as buying cheap stocks. Okay, that's what value means. And uh, usually, uh, how do they determine whether a stock is cheap? They compare the share price to the book value of the company. It's one of the most uh, favorite uh, value metrics. Of course, there are many, many different value metrics out there. But um, the, the classic one is this uh, price compared to the book value. And... Um, the, the, what, what this slide uh, is trying to say is that um, when you compare value and the opposite of value is usually they refer to growth stocks, right? So the debate has always been value versus growth. And um, if you really compare their performance uh, over the past uh, 50 years, okay, over the past 50 years, you can see that uh, I think it may be a bit faint, but um, if you can see there are some uh, shaded uh, light gray areas. All right. So when you see those shaded light gray areas, it means that the growth stocks have outperformed value. All right. The growth has outperformed value. So you can see that uh, it has always been a cycle. Uh, some years uh, value outperformed growth. Some years growth has outperformed value. Right. So they take turn like a musical chess. Uh, but you can start to see that there are extended period of uh, uh, growth over outperformance. Right. Especially since 2007 until now. Right, uh, that's 13 years. Okay, that growth has outperformed value, and um, it has never been that uh, such a long period of uh, growth outperformance or value underperformance uh, before. So that 
uh, came about that question, right? Is value investing dead? Is it permanent? Is this going to be uh, uh, the status quo for a long time to come, right? Yeah. So that's the discussion for today. Yeah, so we'll go into that in more detail, but this is a fascinating chart. Um, and this next one, you cannot separate value, um, sorry, value investing with valuations because as Alvin highlighted, it's about buying cheap stocks. Um, so what, how do you define cheap? It's the valuation that defines what a stock is it cheap or not, right? So the most common one that farmer and friends use was price to book. And this is the, what's called the academic style. And this, uh, these charts and tables are borrowed from AQR. Uh, so the founders Cliff Fastness and, you know, another famous value investing, systematic value investing outfit uh, with a few others. Uh, similar to dimensional um, and largely institutional. So uh, on their metric, you can clearly see that um, we're actually on price to book four and a half times uh, a 4.5 standard deviation. Um, and, you know, we have approached or have breached the level uh, that we saw in 2007 and again in 1999. Uh, but as we say, value is not just a simple metric. Um, Alvin, you know, suggested the difference between systematic investing and a qualitative, you know, valuation metric. Um, people like Warren Buffett would argue that, you know, Benjamin Graham is not really just talking about one single metric of price to book. Um, it's more about businesses and intrinsic value uh, and whether there's, a, a, you know, you know, there's value in the company because it's cheap versus its intrinsic value. And I think the fundamental difference between the two is that, you know, one is a proponent of efficient market hypothesis, that the market is reflecting all information in the price already. Uh, whereas I think the proponents of Benjamin Graham and Warren Buffett style of investing would say that actually the market is not efficient and that, you know, there is mispricing in the market. And as a result, we can buy cheap stocks, especially when there's crises or mispricing in the market. Um, and we would use these metrics as a measure uh, to ascertain whether they're cheap versus intrinsic value. So I think these uh, various metrics just you know, show us what that means. And then to Alvin's point about cycles of factors, I mean, this one um, is from Longview Economics, but basically long, long cycles of growth outperforming and then peaking in the 70s. Um, and then value started outperforming until 1988. Uh, and then during the dot-com bubble, obviously that was a period where growth went crazy and value significantly underperformed for long periods, uh, but then reversed again until, you know, the financial crisis, which is very interesting because, you know, post the dot-com bubble bursting, you would have thought that as growth accelerates, growth would do well. Uh, but I think value uh, continued to do well and quality did very well as well. Um, post the global financial crisis, value has you know, been had some intermittent periods of outperformance, but has consistently underperformed. Um, and it's, you know, interesting that, you know, we're at that point, which on, in terms of this valuation, value versus growth, we're at a, this is relative performance, not valuation, uh, relative performance value is almost, but not quite there yet in terms of 2000 and 1975 peaks, uh, sorry, wrong way. Uh, and then this chart from Robico shows the various, you know, common value uh, factors and how they perform across different decades. So it's the kilt chart. And, you know, as you can see, value and small and, you know, quality tends to do relative quality is not in here, but versus the market tends to do well over multiple decades. 2010s was the first time that value underperformed uh, and was the worst performing factor since the 1930s. Uh, but what, what was especially painful for factor driven investors was that, you know, unlike the 2000s when small cap was the best performing, small caps also underperformed. So small and value both uh, got hit in 2010s uh, and momentum obviously and growth did really well. And so this has been a painful period and that's why it's raising so many questions that it's actually one decade, the previous decade, it did really well, but one decade and later everyone's saying is value dead. Um, so it's interesting how people's sentiment changes so quickly over time. Alvin, anything you want to add before we move to the next slide? Uh, no, I'm good. Yeah, yeah. carry on, okay. please. So this, this one is um, interesting because we did a webinar with Dimensional a few weeks ago. And one of the 
audience asked a question about the, the January 2020 paper from Farmer in French, and we were shocked that people had seen this paper and uh, were commenting on it. But uh, Eugene Farmer and Kenneth French actually did uh, revisit uh, because the original thesis, as Alvin showed, the original paper was 1992. Uh, so, and the study was between 1963 to 92, which is 30, under 30 years. And uh, they realized that many decades have actually passed uh, since you know, the previous study, almost the exact same period of almost 30 years have passed. Uh, since then, up to 2019, so they did an, an updated, uh, you know, you know, study about value, value premium in particular, because it's been the one that has underperformed um, in recent years. And so they looked at the study and they concluded, just you know, it's a very difficult paper. A lot of it is just, um, you know, econometrics or math, mathematics, and it's not a very another paper that if you have insomnia, you want to read <laughs> to make yourself go to sleep. Uh, but basically the conclusion, this is a Bloomberg table, which succinctly summarized it for all of us, uh, thankfully, is that, you know, the traditional premium that was much higher during the 63-91 period has obviously shrunk. Uh, and that's, you know, commonsensical because you can see that everywhere. But during that whole period, obviously, uh, uh, small and value actually held up relatively well. Obviously, small held up better than value. Uh, and one of the questions that they raised was, you know, is it because of out of sample, meaning um, that the strategy got so popular after 1992 when they published the paper and everybody followed value investing and therefore it dissipated uh, the value premium. Um, and so they, they, there was no conclusive, um, you know, answer about whether this has disappeared. Their conclusion is still that you know, if you look at the long-term empirical evidence, value premium still exists, uh, but in recent years, obviously, it has shrunk. Uh, but we are unsure whether it's a cyclical factor or whether there's any structural changes to it. And that's the question we want to raise um, because you know this is the part that is the most interesting because there's so many reasons why value is underperforming, why value is doing terribly, and so I just thought maybe we should list a few and then go into it with Alvin. Um, in more detail. The first one is obviously valuation metrics don't work. Uh, things like price to book or price to earnings is very outdated. There's a lot of intangibles, you know, companies like Amazon are investing in intangibles, R&D, IT spend, you know, they're not building factories. And so price to book is an outdated way of calculating value. That's one question, uh, one, one um, argument. Next one is interest rates. I think liquidity, uh, the tide lifts all boats, you know, the winners keep winning. Valuation is less inter less important, especially with interest at such low levels. It doesn't make sense to be looking at it, uh, giving equities and growth stocks the same valuation as we did in the past. They deserve to have higher multiples. Third one is passive index funds and how flows are affecting the biggest index weights and how winners keep winning again. And then the fourth is antitrust regulations, um, you know, legal stuff, less taxes for companies, less regulations, monopolistic businesses like Facebook and Google and Amazon. And so these guys benefit better uh, because of these things. Uh, private market valuations are inflating growth assets. I think this has started to deflate a little bit. So it's interesting. Um, but, you know, this is defined by SoftBank Vision Fund inflating asset prices in the private space. And that's ha having an effect on the public space because public markets suddenly look so cheap versus, you know, venture companies and private equity companies. And then, you know, major technological changes that changes the way businesses are run. And, you know, a lot of these value companies, the seventh reason, are cheap for a reason. You know, banks are cheap for a reason. They're more heavily regulated. Uh, they're not going to be able to make the same profits as in the past. Oil and commodity stocks and utilities, you know, they, they, they're not, they're going to be hurt. So the value companies are cheap for a reason argument is very common. It has always been. Uh, and then the last one is a scarcity of growth. That post-financial uh, crisis of 2008, um, we realized that actually it's very difficult to find growth. Um, and low economic growth means that growth is rare and there's a scarcity value. And so we should give more higher valuations to growth stocks. So those are the list. We'll go into a bit more detail. Alvin, you want to respond to that and uh, maybe move on to the next slides that you have? We have some fun slides coming up. Um, uh, I largely agree with uh, the list of uh, reasons over here. And um, I think the tricky part is uh, nobody actually knows the answer, right? Mm. Uh, not even farmer in French, right? So 
what makes the rest of us. <laughs> uh, we can only probably um, uh, uh, speculate a little bit uh, what are the more likelier ones. Uh, personally, I do think that the first three points that uh, you have highlighted um, are, are the more obvious ones uh, to me at least. And um, I think the, the first one was that I read this book, The Capitalism Without Capital. Uh, it was quite a good book. I, I think it was published like two, three years ago. Um, so basically they were saying, uh, they were arguing that uh, the, the, the traditional way of uh, counting value, which is essentially book value, uh, is no longer uh, valid because there are a lot of like the intangibles which uh, Sam has mentioned. And uh, if we take a look at, let's say a tech company, right? Uh, and a lot of the uh, most valuable assets, right? are the humans because the humans, the uh, ingenuity that drive the innovation, right? But how are these talents uh, recorded by the accountants? They were record as expenses, right? Because they pay salaries. They are never capitalized as an asset in the balance sheet. So, which means it makes the balance sheet very light, um, very, very asset light, okay? Mm -hmm. And if you use a book value, and, and moreover, another reason is because a lot of these tech companies, precisely, they don't have assets, right? They are unable to obtain a loan from the banks, so their assets are, uh, are not uh, uh, backed by all these uh, uh, loans itself. And then they end up uh, having to raise equity uh, um, as a source of funding, a major source of funding. And uh, they often also don't make money, at least on the initial phase. So even if you use a PE ratio, it's useless because they are making losses. And, uh, but that doesn't mean they are not creating value in the economy, right? And yeah. it probably just take a longer time. So which means um, accountancy does uh, require for it to catch up a little bit. The way that uh, valuation is being done based on the financial statements has also uh, need to be transformed from where it is, right? So because you cannot just uh, operate in an old paradigm uh, when a lot of the situation in the companies and are changing very, very quickly. So uh, that's one. And, and if you even uh, alleviate it to the, uh, economic level, economical level, um, where I talk about GDP and GNP, even those calculations may no longer hold as well. So, uh, which means we are using outdated uh, measurements to mm. measure the current state of affairs, right? So, uh, we need to update the rulers. The rulers are, are no longer telling us the truth. And, uh, uh, and at this point in time, I don't think there's anything being done, right? So, um, I I do think that number one does play a part uh, uh, that does explain why some of these uh, traditional metrics may not be that robust anymore, right? And on the second point, uh, I also agree that uh, because we have been on very, very low interest rate, uh, we're zero now, right, in the US. So given that and a lot of the quantitative easing being done, a lot of money has been printed and flooding the market with this liquidity, uh, the money has to go somewhere, right? Uh, the money doesn't uh, just uh, uh, stay in the streets. It has to go somewhere. And very convenient place, one of it is the stock market, right? So when a lot of money chased uh, after stocks, it tends to also um, uh, increase um, the share prices, right? That's uh, uh, way above what they are valued at. And uh, the, um, with the event of or the popularity of ETFs where uh, the funds are buying the same few stocks in the indices, so that will cause the index stocks to go up even more. And we know that the, the tech stocks have already been the, the, the major components in uh, uh, indices like S&P 500. So when you pump more liquidity to the stock market and into the ETFs that buys these index funds, and in made up predominantly by all these tech companies, then their share price get beat up again and again. So I do think that this is also a crucial factor. And um, the third one, oh yeah, actually number two and number three are linked together. Right? I explained it together already. Yeah. So that's that's my view. And uh, whether um, how long more whether value uh, will remain at this uh, underperformance state? Uh, I don't have an answer. Right? I don't know whether Sam, you have an answer for that. <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but you're right because um, it has been hard, right? Because uh, over ten years, imagine you have been underperforming. Uh, it's not easy for anyone to accept that, and especially if someone has um, been uh, retiring, he definitely will be worried about. 
you know, how long can this drag on? You know, maybe I should start to move on to some other kinds of uh, uh, investments that is not so value. Maybe I should move into growth, etc. Right. Mm. So that's that's a very difficult decision to make. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, we can touch about uh, on some of these uh, slides that you have, but this one maybe we start with this one first. Yeah, sure. Because, um, you know, this is a chart in the U.S. of passive flows. And the first thing that I noticed on this slide was that, you know, everybody thinks passive index means ETF. But in the U.S., actually, there's been more flows into index mutual funds and index ETFs, which was very fascinating for me. But it's a mirror image of how active managers have underperformed in general. And so there's been a huge outflow um, and there's been a massive inflow in, into index funds. And it's served investors well. That's the first thing we should say is that you know, Jack Bogle has been, you know, contributed the most to individual investors in the history of mankind, probably. And that's something that Warren Buffett said. So it's something that's really valid. Um, and so index funds have done well. And so, you know, especially financial advisors um, uh, like ourselves, like Endow Us, uh, would espouse a model that is largely passive. Um, but we also believe in the proven factors of return, like Dr. Wealth and Alvin. And so we do, um, you know, uh, believe in dimensionals products and how um, they're different from other factor models. And maybe I can just at this point share the slide as well. Um, you know, many times factor funds, which are very popular these days, only hold the actual factors. So if you're a value fund, you only buy value stocks. Uh, if you're a momentum fund, then you only buy momentum. Or if you're a quality fund, you only buy quality. What that means is that you actually expose yourself. You're very active. You're very concentrated in the portfolio and you hold a few, a very few number of stocks um, and you're exposing yourself to that single factor. And what that means is that, you know, as Alvin and I spoke about, these factors sometimes underperform. It doesn't perform consistently every year in and out. So different factors can um, give you different returns every year. And some factors outperform one year and doesn't the next. And so what Dimensional and the, the, these guys do better, the systematic uh, quant-based um, uh, passive plus type of um, factor-based investors, what they do is actually give you the whole exposure. So they give you broad passive exposure to the whole market, but then they tilt it. So they overweight the factors of a, uh, the proven factors of return. And because they, own, they don't just do single factors, but all of the proven factors, which is value and small and quality, at different times, different factors outperform. And there's better opportunities when these factors underperform, they overweight the ones that have underperformed. And so give you an additional benefit, but they never not own any of the index weight. So they are broad passive and often own tens of thousands of stocks or 7,000 stocks, right? So I think that's the key difference between these passive plus strategies like dimensional spouses versus the factor only funds. So investors, I think, have to be careful that they don't expose themselves to a single factor overly. They have to realize that they're actually very active and concentrated in their bet and understand what they're exposing themselves to. Um, whereas dimensional would be doing a very broad uh, passive exposure to markets and tilting to the proven factors returns, which is a very different way uh, to expose yourself to factors and probably a safer way um, than to do that. Um, so just going back to our previous slide on passive. So when money flows into passive funds, they just buy the index. And the index is always going to have the heaviest weight at the top. And if you keep flowing money in, as most you know, baby boomers in the US have, and you know, regular savings plans are very popular uh, increasingly in Asia, in people just invest passively in these indexes. And what that does is the argument goes that you keep buying the winners and therefore the growth stocks that are the biggest index rates continue to do well. And the ones that underperform continue to underperform. So this is the argument for the passive active and um, argument. Alvin, anything to add here? Yeah, uh, essentially, I, I think that uh, to add on is uh, because the same stocks get um, invested in over and over again. And uh, that's one of the reasons why the momentum factor has done very well in the past decade. Right, because you just keep buying the winners and you just keep buying the winners and they just get more and more expensive with all the liquidity that's coming in as well. Mm. Okay. 
Uh, there's a question from Victor about what's the magic sauce and how do they tilt the factors for any year? Um, it's basically a systematic quant-based investing uh, process. Um, basically, it allows every day um, Dimension would have a screen of uh, stocks that they would look at. And if you can reallocate your funds um, to the every day, the price moves and the price is reflecting all of the known information. And therefore, you have to think that the price is already reflecting um, the value and the proper, you know, efficient market hypothesis. And therefore, uh, every day dimensional would systematically tilt the fund towards those new value stocks or new quality or new small companies um, that will, you know, give us a better return uh, because they're uh, undervalued. Um, one thing that, you know, somebody has mentioned, um, maybe we can answer some questions before we get, go back to the slides is a question about, um, you know, uh, mean reversion. Um, Alvin, do you, do you believe in mean reversion and especially related to the mean reversion of factors? Uh, so something that, you know, you know, we are often asked about as well. Maybe you can take a crack at that first. Yeah, de definitely I'm a believer of mean reversion. Um, otherwise, uh, I won't be doing value. Right? <laughs> uh, because at the end of the day, if you buy cheap stock, um, you are betting that the, the mispricing is there and eventually the market will realize the value and it will go up, right? So what goes down should come out and what goes up should come down. So essentially, uh, I'm a believer of uh, mean reversion. And uh, it's also one of the reasons why the factors will always cycle out Right, because uh, it is a mini reversion in uh, uh, in effect. So uh, what has done well, then probably next few years it, it doesn't do that well. Um, the only surprising thing is that uh, nobody has expected that the value could uh, stay so underperform for so long and uh, probably a lot of people waiting for the mean reversion to happen for value to climb back up to the throne uh, of, uh, of the highest return. Uh, but so far, we have not seen that yet. Uh, but personally, I do believe that value will come back. Okay, but I just don't know when. Yeah, yeah that's right. We cannot predict the markets, right? Uh, so I just want, you want to share this? <laughs> uh, I, I think I just came across this in one of the blogs. I think it was Zero Hedge or something like this. Um, and basically, it's a comic to talk about um, because value has, has uh, not done well for so long, right? A lot of the investors who have been practicing value has given up and they hop on to the, to the quality bus, okay? And then they move on and say, oh yeah, I see buying for quality, buying for growth is a lot uh, better because the returns are easier. Uh, you are still stuck in a value uh, uh, camp, okay? So this is a comic to say that almost everybody has jumped on the growth bus and abandoned value for good. Yeah, so I, I thought it was quite uh, funny in that sense. Yeah. Very, very, yeah, very good one. Um, everyone, all value investors are beaten up. Now they're being chased out of the, chased out of town. Yeah, nobody dares to acknowledge they are a value investor anymore. <laughs> it's an extinct race, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. so there's another one. Why value investing works, Alvin? Why does yeah, it work? This, this was... Um, uh, uh, infographic from uh, a value investor from India uh, and uh, he, he explained it this way right he said that when value works very well a lot of people will want to be a value investor and I think it's not just uh, a value but all sorts of investing methodology it can be factors it can be strategies or whatever whatever is invoked um, it tends to attract more uh, invested in it because um, uh, as we know most people want some proof of returns Right. They want to say, oh yeah, it has made money. Right. If something has not made money, they never want to go in. The majority, the masses will never want to go in. So they will always will wait for proof of returns. And usually they'll go after the highest returning um, uh, strategies or factors or something that's in folk. Um, and hop on it can be cryptocurrency as well and in 2017. And uh, everybody just hop on, right? So basically investors uh, chase performance. Right, they chase performance. And that is one of the reasons why uh, over the long run, they always underperform because they always buy high. Right? When you wait for something to perform, uh, you always get in a lot later than those who have got in earlier. So uh, when value, there are times where it worked very well and uh, there are probably more people who became value investors. And uh, like what Sam has mentioned, 
um, the value premium may disappear if a lot of money start chasing after the same stocks, right? Mm. And uh, value disappears. And for a long time now, 13 years and counting, okay, and uh, more and more people each year has given up on value. And uh, when value investors disappear as a, as a majority, uh, that's where value investing come back again, right? So that is why value investing works and why is it always a cycle? Right, because um, there's always uh, something in bulk and investors chase after it and then it stops working and then the cycle repeats. Yeah. That's right. So the common phrase that everybody uses as an advisor is past performance is no indicator of the future performance, right? Yeah. So recent performance is an even worse indicator. If you want to look at really long-term performance that has some information for us, that's where factor-based investing comes from. But I think there's a recency bias uh, people just look at the most recent one year or three year track record and we'll get to it in a bit, but Robinhood investors look at the past one month, one week performance, right? <laughs> so probably uh, I think that's a, a real problem and why financial education and literacy is so important. Um, but also, you know, it's important to know that when things go to extremes, uh, that does tend to be a mean reversion. And so when value goes to an extreme, it, it should, uh, come back. The only question to that argument would be, what is value? Um, is it price to book or is it a different metric of cash flow? Um, so I think it's the right time maybe to ask, you know, answer one of the questions Victor was asking, you know, pri price to book ratios may not be the right way to look at it. Um, other people have talked about, you know, um, Muhammad was asking about discounted cash flow and EV bit the multiples uh, as an alternative measure to find good stocks and value stocks. Uh, what do you think? Um, and Damon, Damon was asking about beta and P value as well. So there's a lot of questions about valuation and what works uh, when you're looking at um, value. Um, so maybe Alvin, if you can address your thoughts about those things. Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, as we started off this discussion, we mentioned that value is not just price to book. And definitely, um, uh, there are a lot of other uh, metrics that uh, the audience has mentioned. So all those can also be used, okay? Um, the only issue is that uh, no matter what value metrics you use, actually, in the past 10 years, uh, it only do moderately well the bad at best, okay? Yeah. So um, you just buy anything that's uh, more expensive, you actually do better, right? Without using a value metric, you tend to, to do better. So um, definitely, you can use other metrics, all right? And um, the the we also mentioned about the problem with book value just now, uh, given that the the way that the economy has changed, the way that the companies operate has changed. So um, uh, I do believe that uh, value needs to be uh, redefined, right? Value needs to be redefined. Um, but what kind of metric to use at the broad-based quantitative uh, level, that I'm not sure. Right, that one I will probably leave it to Pharma and French to decide, right? Whether they want to change the definition. That's not my my level to do so. But uh, as an individual investor, then um, definitely I would say that uh, book value has its uh, use, okay, but not for all kinds of value stocks. So for example, if let's say you are valuing um, a property company, all right, or a real estate company, uh, which is predominantly uh, determined by its valuation. Right, of the underlying assets, which are in effect real estate. Uh, in those cases, then I think book value is uh, uh, valid, right? If let's say um, it is uh, some other companies where they do not have um, uh, assets that are of uh, such a value, right? That can retain value like a property, um, then book value may not be that suitable. Like if a company has a lot of inventories so of receivables, right? Then the book value probably uh, is not that credible uh, after all. So I guess um, at the individual level where if let's say you are using it more like a stock picker, then uh, you have a lot more flexibility to use the relevant value metric for that kind of uh, company or the businesses that you are looking at. Okay, but uh, at a quantitative level, um, then maybe uh, I would say that book value would be uh, less relevant, right? And maybe uh, redefining it would uh, uh, help value work better in the, in the years to come. Yeah. Okay, that's really helpful. And, you know, I think one thing that people, um, you know, would, it would be good to understand is also, you know, you mentioned sector agnostic kind of valuations, right? Um, and also sector-specific valuations. 
So it depends on what sector you're looking at and you know, different valuation metrics would apply um, for that. Um, so that's one thing that you know you need to understand. And every sector doesn't always people try to categorize like for example, technology as a growth sector and that you know technology doesn't have value. but actually every sector by definition would have a growth and value aspect to it. So for many years, Apple in the technology sector was a value stock because it was low PE. And then suddenly within the past two years, Warren Buffett bought it because it was a value stock, I presume, right? And he bought Amazon. Uh, because it was a value stock, um, because he's a value investor. But I think that's why people should not be, uh, you know, fixated in these like terminologies and be boxed in, uh, which reduces flexibility about free thinking about what investing really is. And you have to really think what value is. So if you're a proponent and a believer that there is intrinsic value uh, to a company or a stock, uh, then, you know, value is basically the present value of, you know, discounting the future cash flows. Uh, and or and or the net asset value, so um, you have to think about what you're actually saying when you talk about valuations, um, and use the right metric for the right appropriate company or the industry, um, and then you have to think also that you know value investors also value other values, not just valuations. So accounting value is one thing, but for example, Warren Buffett always talks about wonderful management, right? If you're in the VC space, it's all about the management, right? So what does the management actually mean? Um, so it's another value that, you know, is not really, uh, it's an intangible value, I guess, right? So I think those things are some, you know, ideas and thoughts that I think uh, makes investing fun and interesting. There isn't just one way of investing and there's, you know, then everybody would be doing that. Um, but value investing in particular has a broad range of investment styles and you should use various different tools uh, to you know, understand whether you know, the valuation is actually cheap or whether you know, it's uh, you know, cheap against intrinsic value. So these, this, this slide is really wonderful. Um, do you, anything more to add before we move on, Alvin? I, I just was, I want to say that um, you made a good point. Like the, the definition of value is so broad that uh, you can define whatever you want. And if you ask like 10 value investors, they won't agree with one another. And uh, if you ask them, what's the definition of your value, you probably get 11 answers, right? So yeah, it's, it's very subjective yeah, yeah. at the individual level. Yeah, I think there's a bit of a triangulation that is that has to happen among the various methodologies uh, to find true value, right? True value, what does that mean? <laughs> okay. Uh, next slide is this one. You wanted you, I wanted to hear you explain this one because I saw this, but I didn't know what it was either. So, <laughs> um, I I picked this up from the uh, paper that was published by O'Shaughnessy uh, Asset Management, which is a value firm. Of course, they are more biased towards uh, value investing. So, um, basically, they were explaining why uh, value has uh, underperformed uh, for this uh, last decade, right? And um, they attributed it to uh, uh, technological changes. And it didn't just happen in this decade, but it has happened uh, in four other occasions uh, in the past, okay, where uh, the first time it was during the Industrial Revolution. And then thereafter, it was the uh, steam and the railways that came up. And then you have the uh, other utilities, the steel, your electricity, your heavy engineering. And then they after the, the boom in manufacturing, and then eventually now we are in the uh, infocoms uh, period and all the tech period. So um, they, they argue that every time when this um, uh, major shift in the economic uh, uh, primary means of uh, uh, production or, or the most uh, uh, new ways of uh, driving the economy forward, um, there's always a phase where value don't do well and uh, growth tends to do uh, a lot better. Okay, but after this phase uh, uh, stabilizes and value will come back again. So uh, essentially they are making the argument and say that uh, tech has changed um, uh, the way that we work, the way that we lived uh, for the last decade and it's stabilizing. So that is some sign that value may come back uh, if history repeats itself. So uh, basically that is uh, what that whole paper was trying to say. Yeah, uh, with this chart, so let's hope so that they are right. Okay, uh, I do hope that they are right. Sounds good. Um, I do have to say that you know Alvin is one of the most well-read 
um, investors that I know. And uh, Serging, who joined us, a good investor last week as well, lo loves to read a lot of books. And it's, uh, it's always good to see. And I always said when I was at Morgan Stanley Investment Management, um, all the analysts that joined, uh, if you don't read, you cannot be a good investor. Uh, because investors are all about learning. The world is always changing constantly. Um, so you have to be flexible minded, uh, but also you have to continue to learn and grow as an investor. And so, you know, it's really wonderful to see, you know, these um, new books, uh, a couple of them I've never heard of either, some of them that I know well. Uh, but even that earlier book, I think you mentioned it was Capitalism. Without was Capital. It? Capitalism Without Capital. I looked it up, Jonathan Haskell. So he's yep, a professor yeah. at Imperial College. Yeah, uh, it, so it, it was a very good book. Uh, yeah, yeah I, each year, each year I have a book of the year for myself, and that was, uh, I think, two years ago. That was a book of the year for me. Oh, fantastic! Okay, I'll definitely take a read, and it's something that is very close to my philosophy about how I see the world as well, um, which is really, really interesting. Okay, and very relevant for this topic. Yeah, it is. So we did this part, and then you know Charlie Munger's famous saying: "All investing is value investing." Where we talked about all roads lead to value yeah. um, and the various people who have made uh, major contributions to what value investing means. Uh, the far left two gentlemen have uh, passed away, uh, but the father of value investing, John Templeton, cyclical value and, you know, timing the market perfectly. Oftentimes, uh, Warren Buffett really, you know, holding on to intrinsic value and just having a being a patient investor for a long time. Uh, David Booth, who started Dimensional in his uh, tiny, um, I think, uh, apartment in New York in the 70s, um, brought systematic value investing uh, and factor-based investing. And the other guy that many people also talk about is Jim Simons, um, who runs the most successful hedge fund, Renaissance Technologies. Um, and they're a systematic fund. Um, and they have the best track record over the long term. Um, but once again, um, as we all know, they, they haven't done very well recently in recent years. And partially, I think these factor driven models uh, do suffer from, you know, biases or, you know, uh, you know, these sporadic periods of underperformance. Um, so that was something that we already discussed as well. Um, so, you know, how do you bring this all together in your investing, Alvin? And uh, what, what is Dr. Wealth's advice and, you know, bringing factors into uh, investing um, for our individual investors. Uh, as we discussed just now, we know that um, there's no one factor that can outperform the the index uh, every single year, and that's why if you just only do one factor, it's uh, pretty risky, right? So, um, this table was pulled out from the book, the Ultimate Guide to Factor Based Investing. And uh, what, they were, what they found was that if you combine more factors into your portfolio, your chances of underperforming will reduce by as much as three times, right? If you look at the last row on this uh, table, right? So you can see the year one, if you combine the factors together, uh, your chances of underperforming the, the benchmark or the index is only 13% compared to if you only have any one of the factors above, um, you have a one third chance of uh, underperforming. Right. So as you can see, of course, the longer you hold any factors, the chances of underperformance will go down. But uh, it's most obvious when you combine the factors together. Just by the the year number three, uh, the third year. Okay. So you will have uh, like uh, only a three percent chance of underperforming the indices. So definitely, uh, doing more than one factor will make more sense, and uh, that's why even for personal uh, investment myself, I do not just do value and size, um, and uh, I also do the profit the profitability part. And in fact, it's important to choose a factor that uh, is the opposite of uh, uh, with one another, right? So usually value and profitability are opposite to each other. And uh, which means if uh, um, when one zig, the other zag, and uh, when the outperformance come, it will pull up the entire portfolio. So that's uh, how I mitigate the, the risk of uh, overexposing to one factor, like what Sam has mentioned just now as well, right? You, the dimensional uh, funds actually do the tilting um, to other factors, uh, especially those that are, are, are not invoked, right? To do some rebalancing of factors as well. So uh, this is something that uh, I believe, and you cannot just have one kind of uh, stocks in your portfolio. It's uh, pretty risky actually. 
Yeah, that's right. And so actually, I, I'm going to just jump a little bit and come back to the stock discussions a little bit later. But if you don't mind, Alvin. Sure. Um, so I'm going to just jump on to, you know, the previous slide that I showed um, about how the tilting actually works. But really, it's about diversifying your factor exposure. And as Alvin highlighted, making it a multi-factor model actually improves your chances of, you know, gaining the advantage of those factors. Um, the other thing is, I think one person was asking some questions about, you know, um, the factors and how they um, are tilted. Um, and really, this, this is sort of dimensional systematic investing. There's no robo, there's no AI involved. It's actually a very simple modeling. Um, it's a quant based model. That's why we use the phrase quantitative modeling um, and also implementing it in a systematic way. So there's no human emotions involved at all. Um, it really is based on numbers and we let the numbers do the talking and, and that's the best way to do it. But it's also important to, as a result, get gain broad market exposure and have multiple factor exposures that Alvin may, uh, mentioned because precisely because of the things like value. Uh, which can underperform for long periods and it's happened before it's not like this has never happened and you know we know that and that's why we, we shouldn't buy just the value stocks and only the value stocks we should have this multi-factor kind of framework which is actually a more robust and better framework to use and just on the diversification benefits um, and i think you know alvin mentioned correlations so having factors that don't correlate with each other is really important Having stocks that don't correlate with each other is also good if you're building a portfolio um, over a long period of time. And so having funds that don't correlate also, you know, is helpful. Uh, having asset classes like equities and bonds, which don't correlate, is actually beneficial as well. And the reason is because of the benefits of diversification. It's what Harry Markovitz said is the only free lunch in finance. Uh, but if you look at some of the other benefits of diversification, we show that Look, if you, you know, it's very difficult to pick the top 10% outperformers each year. But if you miss those because you pick other stocks, then, you know, the index performance declines uh, by almost 5%, 4 or 5% if you exclude the top 10 performance. If, if you exclude the first top 25% of stocks that have outperformed, um, then you actually be negative instead of long term. This is the long term compounded returns annually. So the, 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 um, what how people look at this chart is that that's precisely why you need to pick stocks and only own the top 25 or that's precisely why you need to own only the top 10 performers every year uh, but i think the point is that it's very difficult to pick winners every year the top 10 performers because they change every year and so um, it's really important to be diversified and then geographically we've also shown that you know each country doesn't always outperform every single year it's very difficult to outperform and having a narrow, concentrated and active position in both stock level and also like country level is very is not a very um, you know, effective way to gain long term returns that are positive. Um, it's actually prone to negative returns because you time it wrong. You're trying to time the market. And I think the, the, the fallacy of the other fallacy that we see a lot among active investors is, you know, even when they switch to passive because they give up, they can't do it, uh, generate the long-term returns. Uh, they want to leave it to professional investors, which is great, but they go to the STI uh, indexes, the passive exposure. Uh, but when we say passive, I think it's, you know, Lou, our friend calls it the super terrible index. And um, Alvin, you can chime in about your views about STI, but, you know, in our view, STI is, you know, in this picture, less than 1% of the global market. And so it's really important to be globally diversified so that you can really get exposed to the best companies around the world and the most competitive companies. And the stock market does the screening for you. It, it does naturally bets on and prices higher the best companies who continue to deliver, who give you uh, the returns. And so we let the market do that for us instead of having to try to beat the market every time. Uh, any comments on STI, Alvin, before we move on? Uh, I, I would just say that uh, what I observe is uh, investor uh, uh, tends to invest with a real view mirror, which we um, talked a little bit about just now, chasing performance. And um, the, top, the topic nowadays is that, oh, just buy US stock, just buy US stock, right? Just forget about Singapore right? because Singapore stock doesn't do well at all, right? It's stagnant for the last 10 years, just wasting time. And uh, 
uh, and we all know that uh, there's uh, the the winning country or the country with the top performing uh, top top performance will always be different, right? Um, this cycle, uh, US is uh, clearly uh, one of the best countries to put your money in, but it wasn't the case in the previous bull run that was leading up to uh, the two thousand financial crisis. If you have invested in that period uh, between the dot com bust and the financial crisis, uh, it's actually uh, one of the uh, Poor uh, performing markets uh, yeah. in that. In we have the a slide on that, Alvin. Here, I yeah. Okay, that's slide. great. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. top left side, you see the decade returns, and S and P five hundred, the U S. actually during two thousand two thousand nine, was not not only underperformed EM, which was up one hundred and sixty two percent, but it was actually negative return yeah. of nine percent. Yeah. yeah. So if you have um, uh, just follow. Um, a real view mirror investing kind of a style, then you would think that, oh, in the next bull run cycle, uh, just buy US, just buy US. You, you would jump to a conclusion um, based on uh, uh, recency bias or availability bias, right? That you think that, oh, that's, that's what I'm exposed to and that should be how the market is working. But the market always changes because if it's so easy that we just have a 10 year series, you just follow whatever has happened before and you just project forward, everybody will be very rich right? <laughs> uh, in, a, in a very quick time. So um, uh, what uh, we need to be uh, paying attention to is that uh, over the long run, then uh, it's always again better to uh, diversify to a few countries, right? Globally, the best, okay? And of course, uh, the leading economies, uh, you should have some weightage to it because they drive the entire global economy, you cannot run away from that. And um, that means the US and even China will be very important markets to get some exposure to, uh, besides just uh, in Singapore, right? But uh, um, to defend some uh, pro-Singapore investors, uh, I do think that they have some valid reasons just to invest in Singapore, right? So for one is that um, they tend to be dividend investors, that means they invest uh, in hope of receiving dividends payout from the companies, right? And uh, Singapore is one of the highest yielding, uh, uh, dividend yielding uh, stock market in the world, right? I think even the STI now is doing like what, 4%, right? Uh, and there's no dividend taxation. And we know that Singaporeans are very, tend to be more asset rich and cash poor. So dividend investing do make a lot of sense uh, for Singaporeans where uh, they can get this uh, payout um, more regularly and that can help them in their retirement right? rather than uh, having to sell a portion of their portfolio for that uh, liquid liquidity. Um, so um, I, I think that uh, Singapore market do have a role to play, but it's more on the dividend side. Lah. But if you are more on uh, growing your wealth, then I would think that a global um, global exposed portfolio will make a lot more sense just, than just narrowly investing in Singapore alone. So again, depending on the objective of the investor. Yeah, yeah that's a really important point, Alvin. It really is. I think everybody has different circumstances, different financial situation that they're in. Um, and for those who do value income, I think, yeah, Singapore does have a high dividend yield. Uh, a lot of REITs, REITs company, uh, REITs, uh, listed REITs, which are have attractive dividend yields, and that's why those are popular. Even you know fixed income exposure, uh, the income type of distribution funds are quite popular in Singapore, precisely because you know Singapore is very asset rich and income poor. Um, so I think that's 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 a very valid point. Um, but also, but you have to understand that what you're giving up in return uh, for that income, because the capital gain. Um, for STI has, you know, lagged the other markets uh, in terms of return. So I think it's finding a balance is really important. And then, you know, meeting your own personal needs and understanding it and understanding exactly what you're exposing yourself to is really important. And having a plan that combines the two would be great, right? If you can build some wealth over the long term and get some yield and income along the way, that would be really Really helpful. But on that note, I wanted to go back to uh, your previous slides. Oops, sorry, went the wrong way. Um, about some stocks, because we can't end without talking about some value stocks and, um, you know, the whole Robin Hood, Robin Hood kind of craze that's been happening around the world. Um, we've also had some, you know, sad stories, right? Because the young man uh, committed suicide because of some you know, option trading. And I think that's, you know, tells us about the perils of, you know, active investing or using leverage or, um, you know, um, um, you know, um, these kind of derivative products as well. But, you know, 
Robinhood and retail investors are winning big in the US in particular. And so it's, it's almost like a second wave of like active individual stock picking investors uh, that I don't think we had since like the E-Trade Charles Schwab kind of days, right? So uh, when costs came down for internet brokerage, um, but you had a couple of slides to talk about this. So I want to share with us, Alvin. Yeah, definitely. We were, we were talking about what are some of the trending stuff in the investment world. And of course, Robinhood have uh, taken the headlines for the past few weeks for uh, mostly the wrong reasons. Uh, as you mentioned, there was a very unfortunate case where someone, uh, Alex Kearns, uh, in his 20s, right, early 20s, uh, committed suicide uh, because he was uh, shocked that he had a seven over 700,000 loss in his uh, account. Uh, which was happened to be an error uh, in the Robin Hood's um, uh, the app itself. So uh, in fact, it was actually uh, profitable, right? But he took his life. And uh, of course, there can be a lot more other stories like his, just that um, they didn't make it to the news. Maybe um, they also suffer great losses, uh, just that they are not publicized. And um, that's, uh, like what Sam mentioned, the, the dangers of uh, uh, investing, active investing, especially if you don't know what is going on and you are just jumping in for the quick buck here and there, um, you, might, you might make very uh, costly mistakes along the way. Uh, but to defend uh, these investors is that uh, myself, I was also drawn into the stock market in 2007. That was the previous uh, bull run and all the previous bull run. And uh, I think it is normal for people to get interested in investing uh, when the market is really active, right? Otherwise, most of the time when the market is uh, normal, um, it's not mm. exciting and people don't, don't jump into it. People are not interested because there are so many things in life that um, will take precedence. Right, like maybe the cat videos will be more interesting than looking at the stock market, <laughs> or uh, some Netflix uh, uh movies. Right, you don't wake up one day and say, "Oh, today I'm going to take care of my personal finance." Nobody does that anyway. You always need certain external uh, stimulus in order for you to take certain action. And um, personal finance is usually um not at the top of the priority list. So I do think that volatility has its uh good. Uh, advantages uh, like really uh, getting the attention of people who have not done anything to their money to to really uh, get get it going right and of course they tend to also happen on the wrong end uh, uh, we always uh, pay the school fees to the market first right because we always think that uh, especially the younger uh, selves right we always think that uh, we we are much better than the rest you know the overconfidence bias is always there uh, we can beat the market it's so easy I, I think this stock is going to go up right i'm just going to buy it but uh, probably don't even know what is uh, uh, the financial statements and probably they don't even open yeah. up to even take a look right it's really just punting and speculating yeah. and uh, this list of stock uh, is actually taken from robin hood uh, website uh, they publish these 100 most popular stocks, uh, I think, every day. So you can see what kind of stocks uh, the, the users are buying, right? And you take a look at this list, and most of them are in the, the automotive industry or the airlines where, or even the cruisers, right? Where they get hit a lot um, by the COVID-19, right? And uh, a lot of them are punting these uh, stocks and to bet on the recovery, right? Um, uh, no right or wrong, it could be a valid thesis that's behind it. But uh, my guess is that uh, probably most of them didn't even do much due diligence when they buy this. And uh, why I say that is that uh, probably we can go to the next slide. Yeah, sure. Okay. But before we go, actually, um, yeah, I want to say yeah. that remember when we were talking, it's interesting that me, uh, the obvious names are not here, the tech stocks and you know all those stocks. Um, a lot of these you can actually class, classify as value stocks, right? Uh, automotive companies, GE, the airlines, um, cyclical value or, you know, you know, secular value sectors are represented here. So that was really interesting. Um, do you see any of this kind of trend of individual investors maybe coming back to value? Or are you hearing any of this? Or this is, was this a surprise to you as well when you looked at this? Um, I... I think I was uh, more on the surprise side when I see this list. Uh, definitely, I was thinking like in terms of like Tesla, Nikola, right? mm. <laughs> those kind of very uh, fast-paced growth stocks that will be uh, a favorite among the younger investors. And um, 
this is a list that uh, definitely looks like more of a more senior investor <laughs> that will buy into them. Uh, I, I'm not sure whether they are jumping to, to back to value, but I am quite uh, uh, sure that this list will change pretty quickly. Uh, yeah. every week <laughs> so it does shows a lot of that short term short termism in in all this uh, stock picking that they are doing right? Uh, right probably two weeks ago it was tesla and nicola that were up there right then now yeah. you see all this ford and g and american airlines probably is whatever stocks that um some influencer on tiktok are talking about right yeah. and then you chase after all these things so it's like your next slide right this guy yeah, <laughs> yeah. so um, um the 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 Weirdest part uh, or the weirdest stock that people were trading was Hertz, right? Because it has filed for bankruptcy and it seems like the stock event investors don't even care. And what is the consequences of being uh, uh, filed for bankruptcy is that their share price can eventually go to zero, right? But uh, these investors are buying them up. Uh, from $1, they bought it up to $5 and that's like a 400% gain in a week. Right, four hundred percent gain a week. You don't even need to wait for it for ten years to do that. So, uh, it seems like uh, people are just speculating, and um, if even for value investor, right, to buy a company that has filed for bankruptcy takes a lot of courage to do so, <laughs> and uh, people are just jumping in like mad. So, I really uh speculate that they didn't have much due diligence done. Uh, when they buy all these stocks. And you start to see a lot of the overconfidence that's uh, flowing into uh, the social media as well. You have this guy, Dave Port Portnoy, who became very uh, famous, uh, making a lot of big uh, statements and bashing Warren Buffett all the way and say that, you know, uh, Warren Buffett was wrong selling all his airlines. Now I'm making a, a, a lot of money by buying all these cruises and airlines. Probably he's one of the guys who have influenced Robin Hood traders to buy all those stocks that was uh, in the list uh, that we saw just now. So uh, I, I just feel that it's very speculative um, and um, uh, I hope that uh, the the mistakes are not costly. Uh, if 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 it is a mistake itself, right? Uh, but uh, when I first started, I also experienced um, uh, buying the hotter stock. Uh, I remember during the two thousand seven period, uh, oil and gas was the hottest, right? Oil and gas shipping, all your commodities related because inflation was on the highest side, and uh, Capital Corp and Sam Corp Marine, all these were very uh, were the darlings of uh, the stock market. So um, I also bought some shipping stock and I doubled my money in a week, right? So I thought that I was still schooling then, right? So just like a young Robin Hood trader now uh, that's experiencing it. So um, uh, I actually stopped going to classes, right? So I thought that, ah, actually, I don't need to study anymore, right? And I tried to trade the market and I lost half of my capital in a month, right? 50% wow. loss, right? So then I realized that, okay, let's go back to school, right? <laughs> I, I, I guess that's how a lot of the young investors and traders will learn, yeah. right? Mm. Uh, because no matter whatever advice you try to put across, it never goes inside the head. Yeah. Like these right. little guys, huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, and and it, it's funny because you start to see the, the older hedge fund managers coming out to teach them a lesson and saying that, oh, you know, you're going to end up in tears, right? In the exact world of Cooperman, uh, all these uh, Robin Hood traders. And uh, it, you, and there was an interesting stats that was pulled up by Investopedia where they found that the bearish investor tend to be from the boomer generation and then the bullish investor tend to be the younger millennials. So um, there is in fact like a generation gap and the more experienced you are, the more that you have witnessed the ups and downs of the stock market. I, I do think that uh, people become more prudent over time. Right? They, they become more risk averse, uh, especially when they, they learn their mistakes along the way. So mm -hmm. I do think this is uh, some sort of rite of passage for investors. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, there's another slide that I actually had down here, this one. Um, I don't know if you've seen this one. This came out from Fidelity and it showed that, you know, the percentage of investors by age group who ended up selling all of their equity positions during the market fall, during February and May. Um, and that average for the whole is about between 15 and 20%. Uh, but the, you know, the older age group is actually 25 to 30% plus. So it's, it's a bit sad to see uh, that they've missed out on the rebound. But, you know, to your point, there is more conservatism and people are a bit more cautious about how they manage money. And obviously, in old age, you want to protect capital as well, right? 
But I think it also goes to show how people still are trying to, you know, time the market and believe that they can actually be ahead of the market. Um, so these people sold and in fact, net net, they've actually been what they will be worse off. Um, so, you know, and they, I think the other thing people need to understand is that even if you're 65, you're not going to take all the money and spend it all at once. Um, you're going to have to, you know, invest for at least what, 20, 30 years until you're 90, um, or even living up to hundred these days, um, is very common. And if you don't invest, then it's highly likely that you may run out of money uh, too soon, especially if you sold at the bottom like this. So I think that's something that I think people need to realize that they need to continue to invest. Maybe more conservatively is the right way to do it. But I think it's better to do that. And the other thing is, you know, the mantra these days is cash is trash, right? So, you know, cash is yielding zero. You know, interest rates have fallen so much that it's not giving you anything. So holding money in cash is negative return, real returns. So against inflation, um, it's actually the worst thing to do. And this is a table that JP Morgan published about, you know, annualized returns over a long period of 30 years. Um, what, you know, individual investors actually uh, did versus, you know, the actual market or any other kind of asset class. Um, and it was barely in line with inflation. Um, and the reason is precisely the type of, you know, behavioral mistakes that you mentioned. Um, they chase rallies or sell at the bottom or they hold too much cash and that drags on the performance of individual investors. Um, so with that, I thought it was it would be really interesting to, you know, uh, talk about how um, in the previous generations in the 70s, um, you know, the equivalent of the Robin Hood stocks um, in, you know, the 70s or actually not Robin Hood stocks, maybe the, the big tech stocks or, you know, whatever everybody thinks is the growth or bubble stocks. Um, a lot of companies in the 70s, what, what was known as the terrific 24 in the nifty 50. Polaroid obviously has disappeared. A lot of these companies have disappeared. And then you look at the peak of 2000 when, when markets, um, you know, well, actually in 2000 March, uh, post the financial tech bubble um, almost bursting uh, or in the process of bursting, a lot of these companies, as we know, what happened to General Electric, um, you know, um, Oracle, IBM, Nokia has disappeared. Uh, Nortel went bankrupt. Um, a lot of these companies have disappeared as well. So, um, you know, it's important to understand that, you know, picking winners all the time, although Microsoft uh, disappeared and then came back again, right? So that's been a good one. And there is always some companies that continue to do well. Um, there's no doubt about that, but it's, it's, it's really important to understand uh, what risk you're exposing yourself to. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about apart from diversification is this issue of cost and how, you know, if you look at the funds and investments in general, um, there's a clear, um, you know, relationship between cost and returns. Yeah, and Morningstar uh, did the survey and to our point earlier, about recency bias and looking at recent performance and being, um, you know, um, fooled by the recent performance. Um, you know, Morningstar did a survey about their five star rated uh, funds, uh, which look at the previous three year track record. And in the next five years, the ones that maintain five stars was only 17%. So it's very difficult to continue to outperform uh, consistently over time. And that's why, you know, the, um, the ability to, to have a diversified portfolio and passive exposure to markets at times. Uh, but if you're an active investor to be really, you know, understanding of the risks you're taking and why you're taking them. Um, and I think it's really always important to reduce cost at every layer, uh, which is something that Indawas is uh, really focused on. Um, and then, you know, just, just over long term, you know, what markets do. Uh, so some interesting slides about how markets are skewed positively, how we're always climbing a wall of worry. <laughs> so right now we're worried still about a second outbreak, you know, uh, fiscal policies, you know, uh, inflation coming back and, you know, many other than trade wars. Uh, but equities uh, tends to continue to do, you know, well over time. And the other thing that we always show is this bear market chart about how you know it feels so bad but oftentimes it's much long uh, shorter than you think and the bull market is much much longer uh, than you think and people trade out of markets or sell too early that's a uh, common mistake 
Um, and Alvin, just like you, when I was younger, it was the same. I, you know, I was an active investor. I picked stocks uh, at Morgan Stanley. And when I was younger, I had a much higher appetite for, you know, stocks and, you know, riskier bets. Um, and I would like put all my eggs in one basket with some of my investments and go all in. Uh, so it's more like gambling habits that I had, right? So um, I think it's very important to differentiate gambling with investing and how to build portfolios well over the long term. So Warren Buffett says stock market is a device to transfer money from the impatient to the patient. And I think, you know, even if you're value investors, you need patience. Um, but, you know, especially if you are like trying to uh, buy value stocks that will eventually come back and, um, you know, give you the returns that you deserve for your patience. I think, you know, this is really, really important to understand. So Alvin, um, with that, I want to maybe answer some questions before we head out, but maybe any some comments that you have on this or any other things before we move to questions. Just, just to add on to uh, you mentioning about the cost, right? So we all know that returns are not guaranteed, right? But costs are guaranteed. So if you can manage your costs, uh, do it right to the minimum level and then the upside will take care of itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very important. Um, so there was this issue of timing the market. What are, you, what are your thoughts about timing the market? Uh, Kok Kang um, asked a question about, you know, if you are a value investor, then does that mean you have to sell high and then buy low uh, and trade the market as a result and time the market? I, I think timing the market, probably different people have a uh, different definition as well. How I would define it is more of a, a short-term kind of uh, entry and exits uh, based on certain indicators. Um, my experience is that I meet a lot of like uh, uh, investors out there and uh, in terms of uh, market timers, right? And those who invest for long term, I see uh, more people succeeding with uh, long term investing than market timing, right? I'm not saying that isn't uh, successful with market timers. I have met them before, but they are really, really few and far in between. So, um, uh, based on uh, these odds, right, then I know uh, which camp I should be in in order to have a, a slight advantage uh, because statistics have shown that uh, it's really a very hard game. Uh, many people have tried it before and uh, only a few have succeeded so far. Mm. Yeah. So there's a couple of questions um, that maybe I can answer as well. So one is uh, Jin Yi Chua was asking about the last decade and how partly caused by the Fed intervention and QE1, 2 and unlimited QE. So it's partly what, what we discussed earlier, Alvin, about, you know, policy and interest rates um, and how macro sometimes affects, you know, value investing and investing in general, because, you know, companies are driven by macro fundamentals as well. Uh, but the only thing I would say is that, you know, it's very difficult to forecast macro, right? Economic data comes out with such a lag uh, trying to predict, you know, an economic regime and try to move ahead of it and say, you know, I would have done this in 2008 is very, I think, I don't think it's, I think it's a bit facetious um, to think that you can predict, uh, uh, you know, where the economy and the market is going. So from my perspective and in a holistic manner, I think market timing is, is in general a loser's game. There are certain guys who are very good macro guys who look at leading indicators um, and try to time the market. And there are systematic guys, quant-based guys who do that relatively better. Uh, but I have yet to see somebody who has consistently, you know, timed the market so well that, you know, um, that, you know, they prove us wrong. Um, and I think it's easier for us to admit as human beings, we cannot predict the future, what will happen tomorrow. Uh, but we think when it comes to financial markets, we suddenly become like, we're able to predict the future. Um, so I think, you know, that's something that is a, cognitive dissonance, you know, in behavioral finance, uh, there's a gap between what we think and the reality that we face. Uh, and we sometimes don't see that. Um, anything you want to add on macro or currency or this kind of policies that you that we've seen, um, QE, liquidity? I think macro is the hardest of all strategies. <laughs> it's the hardest because economies are very, very complex, right? And uh, you, you never know at one point in time what is the main driver. Mm. And there's no way you can prove or disprove uh, causes of uh, certain effects. So um, I think it's just too complex for the human mind to really yeah. understand it properly. Yeah. Yeah. So I think one thing that people make a mistake on is the difference between correlation 
and causality, right? So you can always like from a like a numbers game, you can make something correlate with each other. If you use daily charts or weekly or monthly, you know, if you cut from 2007 March to 2011 November, it works actually quite well. Um, so people like manipulate data to bring correlations to work. Um, but actually, it doesn't necessarily mean that this is what caused the market to do this. So I think it's really important to understand whether there is a causality, if there's a correlation that is justified and whether one thing led to the other thing uh, that led the market or stopped to do something. Yeah. There's even a, a site that is dedicated to spurious correlations. Yeah. I just list down all the spurious correlations and, and some are quite funny, right? So yeah. you can go and take a look if you're interested. Uh, which slide is in here or where? Uh, no, no, as in uh, there's a website. There's a website. Oh, there's that, a website. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they just uh, plot all the spurious correlations. Yeah. Okay, it's yeah. Quite funny. It's, yeah, for entertainment. Yeah, spurious is a good word. We applied it to a farmer in French and their value premium as well, whether it was spurious or not. <laughs> so um, I think we're out of time. We, we have a couple more questions, but it's not specific to the topic today. So um, at this point, I'd like to thank everybody um, for joining us. Uh, sorry if we didn't answer all your questions. It's quite difficult to um, look through everything and answer it. But please reach out to Dr. Wealth and Alvin. Um, they have some wonderful uh, seminars and you know they're doing a fantastic job in improving financial literacy and financial education. So we're big fans of Dr. Wealth and Alvin's team. Um, and uh, also in Dallas, um, so a quick plug again, um, one thing that actually we didn't talk about is cash because I did want to talk about this. In developed markets, money market funds are very common in a, in a go-to strategy, especially when people become very defensive. Um, do you have any thoughts about cash, Alvin, before we final, finally complete? Um, do you have a cash strategy or do you, uh, do you tend to be a fully invested investor in the markets? Um, I, I tend to uh, have cash at times, uh, depending on the opportunities that I see in the market, because uh, essentially I'm more active in that sense. So uh, if I find more ideas, then I will deploy more cash towards the market. Um, and yeah, basically, uh, if I have a choice, I will want to keep cash mm. if I have a choice. Yeah. yeah. So then the next question becomes what we're going to talk about next week. What do you do with that cash? Because yields are so low deposit rates and savings deposit rates are getting slashed. Even Singapore savings bonds, are, you know, it was 2%. Now it's down to 0.3, you know, 0.8% is crazy, right, Alvin? Yeah, in, in fact, the mortgage rates has also gone down. Yeah. It seems like a good time to, to, <laughs> to you know, yeah, refinance your houses and, and lower your uh, interest payments. Yeah. Actually, it's interesting that COVID has led to an improvement in household balance sheets because people are not going out. For those people who uh, continue to have a job and an income, obviously there's a lot of people suffering out there as well. So we understand that. But for those who have a continuing income or have families, um, you know, those balance sheets are being, you know, improved because you're having income, but you're not spending. And, you know, you actually, interest rates are coming down. So loans and payments have come down and you refinance your housing and it's actually giving you, so this, you know, revenge consumption may be a real thing upon us once the markets and economy is open. Um, so anyway, so uh, webinar, a plug for next week where Greg and I will be talking about how to manage cash efficiently. And in Dallas has some interesting, important announcements to make about that. Uh, but Alvin, thank you so much for joining us. It was really a fun time um, talking to you. I hope we can do this again sometime. Um, I know you're very busy, uh, but so thank you for your time and uh, your contributions today. Yeah, th thanks, Sam, and thanks to the Endowas team. Uh, thank you for having me. I have, I have fun talking to you. I hope it wasn't too difficult for the audience to understand what we were discussing. Yeah, I worry about that too at times, but you know, hopefully it was helpful. And uh, thank you again for joining us, Alvin. And I'd like to thank everybody who joined us today. Uh, thank you and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. See you guys.